Okay, thank you. Uh, there was one thing that I wanted to add concerning the uh, Clarion Knowledge Center, which is that we are also joined by. So the Clarion Knowledge Center is a is a distributed center, as it is called, which means that it's not only one institute um, responsible or or maintaining the center, but it um, it consists of multiple institutions. And today we're also joined by dear colleagues from, from EDS Mannheim, who are also part of uh, this Knowledge Center. And in particular, um, one of the talks later by Harald Lüngen. Um, he's an active member in this, in this um, Cloud and Knowledge Center. So we are already repre represented um, by two institutions and uh, Clarin as the host of the Knowledge Center is also represented by Alexander König, who is also um, given his history that until one and a half years ago, I think, he used to work here at uh, Oilac Research, is also um, closely connected to this research, um, to this center. So I will be talking about data management and far, far, fair guiding principles in um, relation to CMC corpora. And my personal view on this usually starts with something that goes very, very far back in, in my own studies. Basically at the very beginning when I started studying um, and was in, in, I think it was basically my very first course on general linguistics, we were asked to basically answer this question. What is linguistics? So to come up as as a as a new student with what is the answer to to the endeavor that we're starting to learn about linguistics, and what was a one of the possible answers that that at the time was given is that linguistics is the scientific study of human language, which which seems rather trivial, but it holds a lot of of potential to go into details of what the individual parts mean. And one of them is what is actually human language. And there is a very, very, at least for me, nice answer to this that dates back to the 1920s. And the bottom line of it is basically literally the bottom line. Um, and I'll leave the rest to read later on in, in a handout, which is that language is a is a mass is a massive massive and and inclusive art um, that has been piling up for generations. The the next part of this question or of the answer to this question is then scientific, and then what is actually determined? What do we mean by that? And and the answer to this at the time was that roughly. So it's sort of a a rough estimate of what the direction is, that it is objective, unbiased, data-oriented, and reproducible among other meanings. Simply put, linguists are encountered uh, are concerned with how language actually does work rather than with how others say that it uh, ought to work. And the, the particular interest that, that I come back to over and over again um, during thinking about how to apply fair principles is basically that science, independent of, of whether you work with computers or not, always ought to be data oriented and reproducible. And this has been an interesting uh, endeavor for, for myself and, and, and how um, I see it. So, Fast forwarding from when I was a young student, um, recently and, and maybe not so recently, but over the course of let's say the last 10 years at least, um, there is a, a trend in social sciences and humanities and to be honest in many other fields as well, where they try to become more, I want to stress the more, it's not that this has never been an issue, but it certainly has been stressed over the last over the last decade, uh, yeah, decade more or less, um, that things should 
be more reproducible and data should be more reusable. And the whole process of how research works and how data is collected and how it is used should become more transparent. And to this end, also the European Commission, and this is a, a, a citation from, from an online newspaper feed from the European Commission from 2016, where they basically say that it's so important to them that it will that they will give a lot of money um, into science or devote a lot of money to specific um, scientific endeavors that should also focus on, on these principles. So it's not that the Horizon 2020, which is mentioned here, is only about this. It is about science in general, but they made it very clear and, and meanwhile it has been put into into the actual wording that the fair principles that we will be hearing more about um, should should be a central part of whatever scientific endeavor we um, walk we start and uh, incidentally around the same time one of the or the main paper that is usually cited when talking about the fair guiding principles, uh, Wilkinson 2016 was also published. And that paper basically started off um, in a tremendous fashion, the, the explicit, the, ex the, the explicit um, longing for research data management on the basis of the fair guiding principles. And they, if you haven't heard them, um, they stand for F for findability, the A for accessibility, the I for interoperability, and the R for reusability. So in our case, we will be talking about fair guiding principles in relation to CMC corpora. So just a short recap of what CMC corpora are, they are, corpora of computer mediated communication and computer medi mediated communication. CMC refers to human communication via computers and includes many, many different forms of interaction that humans have with each other using computers as tools to exchange different data of types, text, images, audio, video, um, and probably recently also no, I don't think that so many more types have evolved, but the way how they are shared is certainly under constant change. Um, an old picture that I that I or an an, almost ancient by now, an ancient picture that I that I often um, like in this context is um, one from the Comrie Corpus from from colleagues from France, and. This shows the, 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 the wide range of possibilities that need to be represented um, in such a corpus. So we see someone talking to each other uh, via video. Um, those people can also chat, but at the same time, different people can interact on a drawing and can collaborate on um, progressing on certain parts of the drawing and um, the, the representation of, of this whole process is something that if you want to um, make this corpus later available and represent it in, a, in, in some computer readable form, ideally you would try to represent and um, ex make explicit all these different interactions. And this is probably the, the largest possible or one of the larger, at least one of the larger um, possibilities of different interactions at the same time. But to, to give you an idea of what probably needs to be represented in CMC corpora. And later on, um, Harald and, and Michael will talk about how to represent these very different interactions, which then in itself will be um, a very interesting endeavor. So the FAIR principles, they start with the F, which basically starts at the point where you would say, okay, I want to use data. 
And obviously the first step in using or reusing data is to find it. Now, the requirements to be able to find data um, as it is defined or prescribed in the fair, in the, in the, um, FAIR principles is that the data should be assigned a PID, a persistent identifier, which means that um, an internet address that you give to a corpus like your project web page is sort of a start for it being an identifier, but it's not persistent. It's not persistent in the way um, as it is required. Um, for that, you would need a system that also traces changes in where you host the data. So in case the data has to move from one institution to another, the persistent identifier would be able to accommodate this change. Whereas your project web page, if for some reason you lose the, the name or um, you can't pay for it and, and basically you move your project web page to an institutional web page that hosts old projects, um, there will be no automated version or, or automated redirect of anything that goes from the old to the new. Then comes the second part in, in findability. That is that there is the data that actually is what we all interested in. But data usually is also accompanied by data about the data, which we call metadata. Um, one of the most important metadata that, that um, comes with, with the actual data is probably um, something like the name of your corpus. And the second most important one, or maybe the first, if you don't take the name because that is trivial, um, the second one then would be the license. So the metadata of your corpus, basically what is, what is the status of, of um, under which you can use the data, which will come up later again in these fair guiding principles, um, and other metadata, as in um, what is the language that this um, data basically represents, or many other things that depend on the domain. Uh, then, of course, the metadata um, should also point to the actual data. and for the usual customer or user or research colleague, it is advisable to, to have your data also indexed in some sort of search engine. Trivially, this would be, this would be Google. So ideally you, you hear of a corpus, you type in the name and you basically get to the page where you can download it. But there are also other dedicated search engines for, for corpus data. And we will, we will see some of them later on as well. All right, so after we found the data, we need to access the data. So what are the requirements given in the fair guiding principles for accessing the data? One of the most important ones is um, that the automatic, the, the, the automated retrieval um, should be possible, which is something that um, means that the the interaction you or, or, or yeah the interaction you need to go through to access the data should probably not be of the kind please write an email and also not of the kind please um, call up and we will discuss the details but there should be some automated way ideally in 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 a form that can also be automated for computers. To this end, it usually is necessary to authenticate and authorize, which comes back to what Jenny said in her introduction about Clarin, which is that Clarin, one of the, I wouldn't say one of the main ones, but, but certainly a, a very, very important uh, feat that Clarin um, accomplished is that they managed to get the federated um, login infrastructure in place. Um, and with that, it really is sometimes as easy as using the credentials of your home university to authenticate 
as a member um, of some educational institution and as such be authorized to download certain type of a certain type of data, for example, that should only be made available for research institutions. Um, and because you, you use your home institution login, the authorization that you belong to some research institution can automatically happen. And then there is nothing more that needs to, that actually needs to happen and you can download the data. This is one of the, the very interesting and sometimes or often overlooked um, parts of what it means to make a corpus available. The fair guiding principles do not necessitate that the corpus needs to be freely or openly available. The data can, the data access can be restricted. However, all the data about the corpus should always be made available publicly. That means that if you say that my corpus data can only be um, shared on the basis of a certain um, inquiry, which does violate one of the, the previously mentioned um, principles, but still, if it is necessary, you can still make the corpus available along the fair guarding principles, but the metadata always should be public. Interoperability means that data should ideally be taken off the shelf and used in your infrastructure. So if you have once created a CMC corpus and have a data processing pipeline that does a certain type of analysis that you are interested in for your language, let's say, and you find a different corpus that has characteristics that are comparable to yours, and let's say is for a different language and you would like to carry out the same analyses that you did for your corpus on this corpus. Ideally, you should be able to take this new corpus off the shelf from the data repository, run it through your data processing pipeline and come up with results. You would still have to interpret the results, of course, but ideally the processing flow, the workflow could be applied. To, 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 to be able to accomplish accomplish this, of course, the, the, there needs to be a shared standard for how the knowledge is represented. This can be sometimes as trivial as using the same label, for example, for part of speech text. I'm not sure how many people have worked with those sort of things. Um, I guess many have and the, the variety of how a part of speech that can, rep, can be represented is vast. I mean, you can call it POS, you can call it POS in caps, you can call it P with a capital and O with a small and, an, and a capital S. You can call it part of speech, you can call it tag, you can call it, I mean, there are many names, you can call it whatever you want, but many names are in actual use. And already this tiny little detail basically would prevent the reuse of a corpus. You would have to change something in your pipeline. Granted, it's nothing big, but still you would have to change it. And as these changes become larger and larger, the changes within your pipeline would prolif proliferate and they would become larger and larger. And in the end, you would have to, well, do quite a lot of, of changing to actually be able to, to reuse the corpus. Proper documentation that holds for so many other things as well, but of course it also holds for how your corpus um, and, and the, the data that is represented in, in, your, in, in your corpus um, has come about and, and um, all, all the details of the decisions that you've taken to represent certain things in certain ways should be properly documented. Even more ideally, so to speak, um, if one can say that, um, 
you should be able to reference the decisions you've you've taken to represent your data and cross-reference it to other people who have, who have basically come up with the same decisions. And ideally, all of you use a shared knowledge of, of um, sort of a, a common denominator of how things should be. And you all refer back to them so that people know that you all share the same understanding of what it means to name certain things X and what you mean by Y and, and how these things have to be interpreted. Reusability. The metadata should be well described so that ideally someone could actually replicate the data that you have collected from scratch and, and uh, um, follow the same, the same path that you followed and come up with similarly structured data. And then of course the, the, the combination um, which directly connects to the, to the interoperability um, basically means that the better you are at, at um, preparing your data so that it can interoperate, the easier it usually is also for others to reuse it. And also for yourself. I mean, let's, let's not kid ourselves. Sometimes it is at least, okay, maybe not for you, but for me, it has often been the case that reusing data that has been um, on the shelf for a couple of years also at times seemed very difficult which is absurd because it, it was data that, that I helped create, but after a certain amount of years, it, it often um, still turned out to be difficult. Um, so the appropriate description of the data in, in, for the reusability in our case often refers to um, how was the data collected? For what reason was it collected? When was it collected? Who collected it? Um, so to have a larger understanding of the context of the data, to be able for others to see the value of it in, in relation to their own data or in relation to their research question or whatever the reason that they're interested in data, they need to make an informed decision about whether your data fits their need. But for that, all as much as possible, at least, um, information about your data um, needs to be given to them. For this also, it is necessary to attribute who created the data, um, institutions, um, but also persons. And then we come back to what I've already had at the very beginning, that the license is a very important part of um, the metadata that, that basically um, much of how people will interact with your corpus starts with the license that you make the data available. Some people will probably just not consider your data in cases where, when the license may be just too restrictive. But in any case, it needs to be clearly visible. So always make it visible what type of license it is that the data um, is available under. And this, the, 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 the provenance comes, comes back to, to what I've already um, partly said, namely that it is important to understand for which reasons um, the data was actually created in the first uh, in the first place. So to give you a somewhat practical example of what all this means, a few years back, I think two years back, there was a paper at um, the CMC conference, um, the same one that that will start tomorrow, and many of you probably will also join, about the the Clarin Resource family. And how the and how the the CMC corpora in this family um, actually how the fair guiding principles apply to these corpora 
in this resource family, um, how this works out, or basically um, how an analysis um, would look like. And at the time, there were 24 corpora of uh, CMC of various sizes in this resource family of um, different languages and of different sources of different types. So Twitter, WhatsApp, blogs, um, chat, room, discussions. Um, and one of the interesting things to start with, um, right from the beginning, looking at the, at the page, was that about half of the corpora were in a Clarin center or a similar repository, and the other one wasn't. So the Clarin, the, the, the deposited uh, corpora um, were in not only in Clarin, but also in Metashare, which is a different uh, European infrastructure project, Zenodo, which is connected to uh, the, the CERN in uh, mostly in Switzerland or in the uh, corner of Switzerland, France and Germany, and used to be, uh, or still is not used to be, still is a, a huge um, particle accelerator research facility for physics. Um, so they know about big data and they um, participate in a European project where they make available their infrastructure for other researchers. And uh, Figshare is, for those who don't know, I think it's an American-based um, corporation connected to some publisher that I don't know exactly who it is, but basically also in, uh, in, in the game to make available infrastructure so that you can deposit data there. We had some um, checklist of properties that we looked into for each individual corpus, um, basically along the lines of, uh, of the FAIR principles, which means that first of all, we wanted to find the corpus. So on the web page, we had a name and we want to be able to find the corpus to this, um, to this end, we started with looking into regular internet search engines like Google and um, Bing, but also the, 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 the VLO, which is the Virtual Lang Language Observatory, which is a search engine specific for Clarine, um, and the, the OLAC, which is a search engine for uh, language data in general. Then we also wanted to, to see whether it was accessible um, for the interoperability, we didn't actually test the interoperability, but we um, tried to make an educated guess depending on the format that it was in and how well the format was documented, whether we would be able to, with fair, with sort of an, an, uh, an a fair amount of work, we would be hoping let's say it like that, we would be hoping to be able to, to make it interoperable. And then of course the reusability um, was judged by how well we understood under which circumstances this corpus was created and for what reason and, and so on. Um, and then of course the licensing situation. And the, the fifth one was more or less a, a personal trait of, of our um, of our understanding of, of how research should continue or evolve. Um, we value open openly accessible corpora more than the others, but this was just a, a remark in a in a larger table um, that I will you show that, that I'm showing you here. The point is not to for you, I'm not even sure whether you're able to actually see all of, of the different um, characteristics. Um, so there is a paper where you, where you, where you can um, find these things in more detail and more readable. I just wanted to, to make sure that you understand that we went through the different um, uh, properties, which once you, sorry, once you start looking into them, you find that the findability sort of has four properties and the others have also sub properties. And we try to um, write down after some discussion, uh, a common understanding of, of what we believe that a fair remark or a fair mark for this corpus in this category would be. Um, 
the summary, which is sort of without looking into all the data in this table. There is a clear distinction for findability um, for deposited and for not deposited corpora. The deposited corpora sort of by um, virtue of them being in a repository come with a PID, which is also machine readable or machine actionable. Um, and the metadata about the corpus or about the corpora, which is um, the size, what in which language is it um, sort of available, not in which language, uh, which language is the data in, um, what is the license that the data is available in. And all these sort of things are usually um, taken care of in a deposited um, corpus from the infrastructure and they are also machine actionable as it is called, which basically means that it's not only written in plain text on the on the website, but there is usually hidden data, um, not visible to humans, but readable by machines. And the deposited corpora are then also usually indexed by domain specific search engines. So. Um, once you deposit a corpus in one of those infrastructures, then they're also picked up by the by the search engines, and often it is it is enough to make it make your corpus available in one of those infrastructures, and it will be picked up by all the other search engines. The non-deposited corpora had the problem of the metadata most of the time was only available via the web pages which means that it was written in clear text, but computers had a difficult time to judge what the what the type of the data is and in which language it was and what the size of it is uh, or was which means that any of the search engines where you where you sometimes um, can sort of filter according to in which language is in, in which language is the corpus is the corpus of uh, type twitter or, or whatsapp or whatever um, wouldn't work because the search engines wouldn't have this metadata Often there was no use of a, of a persistent identifier and some of the corpora were even not available anymore. Or basically the web page that, that was supposed to hold the corpus was not available anymore. And some of the uh, some of the, the 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 corpus data, it was not only no sorry. At the first part, the data, the web page was available, but the corpus wasn't available for a few corpora. Even the web page was not available anymore. Okay, for accessibility, we also had a clear distinction between deposited and non-deposited corpora. The the deposited corpora um, all provided a clear usage license, which comes with the fact that it was deposited because all of those infrastructures or most of them demand um, to explicitly name a license. And the data, given that it was deposited, was also available. Um, sometimes we needed to authorize, sometimes um, we would have needed to authorize um, in a way that we weren't able to, but we believe that if we had been able to, the data would have been available or would have been made available to us. For the non-deposited corpora, the, the best case scenario was that there was a link um, somewhere on a web page, and that actually resulted in a download of some form um, in, in, in a way that we actually had access to the data. Um, as I said, sometimes researchers uh, needed to be contacted first, sort of um, as, a, as a description on the page, please contact us directly via email and you will get access to um, the corpus. So they send us a link or any of, any of those interactions. Um, but often it was unclear under which license we could actually then use the data or even if we were able to download the data, um, sometimes the license information was missing. In, in one case, I think even the license information was contradictory on one page uh, versus the other page. For the interoperability, I or we have to say that at the time we realized that there was no clear distinction between deposited and non-deposited corpora. Um, the deposited corpora, they use structured metadata, but also often crucial information was missing. 
So sometimes it wasn't clear when the when the corpora were collected. So what is the period um, from when to when the corpus was collected? What was the data source? Mm. Then the data came in a, in a wide range of formats, and some of them we considered to be actually very much uh, in accordance with the FAIR principles, but not all of them. And of course, just because you, you deposit a corpus um, in one of those infrastructures um, doesn't, doesn't make it necessary to also deposit in a certain format. You can usually, uh, you have an open choice of what format you deposit your corpus in. And some of the corpora would have benefited from a clear version information, which means that a corpus name in a, in a paper, as in corpus from project XYZ, um, and then there is an iteration of this corpus later um, that you then call, I don't know, um, version 2013 or 2017. And then um, at the point of retrieving a corpus, um, it would be very beneficial if also the very first corpus had already gotten some sort of version moinker, um, some sort of version placeholder, because otherwise it may become difficult later on to understand which of the which corpus actually is referred to at this particular point. The reusability, um, for the reusability, we also found that there was no clear distinction between the deposited and non-deposited corpora. Mm. The metadata that is needed to re reuse corpora is, um, is quite vast. And the problem is that within our community, we may not even have an understanding of actually which are the fields that need to be present. So um, a lot of people um, go by their intuition, and this is certainly the best that we can do. But given time that, that has passed um, between when the corpus was created and when we looked at it, there were certain instances when we couldn't figure out whether this corpus would be you or, or um, sort of the right the right choice for a certain research question in a certain setting. Because as I said, repositories do not demand to fill in a certain set of metadata fields. This is due to the fact that we as a community haven't come up with the with the set of fields. I mean, no no repository um, has an understanding of which the fields would be. And then again, the, the lack of a clear license, which is crucial to reusing any of the data. And a large part of the corpora were also missing um, provenance. So collection period data source, version information, and those sort of things. A short conclusions, like intermediate conclusions, depending on my time. Um, there is a high vari variability of um, how corpora comply or do not comply with the FAIR principles in this list. So basically, um, as a as a represent uh, as a sort of representation of how our community at the moment is. Uh, strategically or, or um, actually uh, positioned within within this question of how well do we manage to make our corpora available according to the FAIR principles. In general, deposited corpora provide much better um, F and A. So the first two letters of the FAIR guarding principles are usually very well dealt with in a deposit in 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 a in a infrastructure setting, but depositing does not automatically improve interoperability and reusability. Um, provenance is crucial for reusing corpus data, but often not described in enough detail. One of the one of the maybe story. Uh, one of the things that come to my mind usually is something that um, Michael told, told us like quite a while back and I think it's even more um, true now. So Michael collected the Dortmund chat corpus and the Dortmund chat corpus is now bah, 
maybe he can correct me, but let's say 15 years old, maybe even older, um, probably older. And at the time, it was collected in chat rooms. And maybe many of us don't even remember or maybe have never experienced chat rooms. And even if we have experienced chat rooms, we may have experienced them vastly differently than um, the people at the time because they had no cell phones. They had probably no laptops. So they were sitting on their static computer, um, probably not even with a huge screen and um, were using some sort of chat software um, to, um, well, to write to each other these chat, chat messages. Now, if you take this corpus 15 or 20 years later, um, it may even be necessary to understand the setting. Um, and for that to be able to understand it, you would have to describe the setting in which the corpus was actually um, evolving, which means that um, often today we say, so this is Twitter data. And basically we take as granted that everyone knows what Twitter is, or we say this is Facebook data and we take for granted that everyone knows what Facebook is. The thing is that five, 10, 15 years from now, it may not be the case that either Twitter exists and even if it exists, it may have changed in a way that um, makes the process of how you interact with the service has changed a lot. So you would also need to describe not only that it is Twitter, but what it actually means to be Twitter. And it also, um, on, a, on a more technical level, um, the change that was introduced with um, automated spelling correction in smartphone keyboards um, also makes it much, um, much different or makes the data much, much different um, from without these, these um, aids. And to analyze the data, you would need to know that obviously this data was collected with some spelling correction on a smartphone. Um, and this one was collected on uh, in some different setting. Obviously, the community, us, we would benefit from commonly accepted guidelines on how to make corpora um, available according to those principles. And this is why these events um, take place and also why other people publish papers um, on CMC conferences, um, because the whole community benefits from a shared understanding of, of um, what it means and how these corpora should be made available. So to give you a short checklist for CMC corpora, um, in case you are still sort of um, in the process of building one, or if you have already started building one, you can go back and see whether you have sort of you check the marks. Um, ideally, you choose and fix a name rather early on, because it, there is probably nothing worse than you having a corpus that in your paper is called um, the, corp the preliminary corpus of project X and you don't name it because people will name it and they will choose a short name and then the corpus and some reference to the corpus will sort of flow around um, and you have no control over the name anymore and there will be diff probably different names available. Um, also think of the possibility that there will be an iteration of this corpus, a second or third version. So use some sort of version placeholder, whether you whether you use Roman um, numerals, one, two, three, or you use some uh, year, as in this is sort of the corpus, the project corpus X 2021, and the next year it will be 2022, or you use a proper version like version 1.0, version 2.0, whatever, but just think about and consider um, using or, or um, taking making space for such a placeholder. Very early on, at, at the best you can do is basically you start, once you have the idea to build a corpus, also start thinking about the license and start working towards it. From experience, we know that um, it may take a while to get all the legal issues in order. So once you have set your 
your mind towards the goal of what the license should be, also start thinking of all the things that need to happen um, to be able to make this corpus available under this license eventually, which usually um, at a university hopefully um, includes or at your research institu institution includes the possibility to ask someone who like your legal department. What we usually advise people who try to, to um, and come to us and deposit data is for all of the, the human readable metadata provenance, uh, uh, what was the research, research question that you try to address with this corpus? When was it collected? And, and all, all the larger picture, um, write it up in a corpus paper. Ideally, don't wait for pre preliminary results write a paper about how the corpus came into being, try to um, publish that. I think the CMC corpora conferences are a good venue um, and it is enough to build a resource. Once you have done your, your research um, and have carried out results, publish another paper. Don't wait for your, for your results to, to dribble in before you publish the, the sort of the corpus paper. And then of course, use an established format to represent your data. Ideally start as early as possible um, to represent it in this, in this um, type of uh, uh, format. In our case, we have access to the TI CMC about which we will hear um, more in the afternoon. Um, and as soon as you have set the format, all the other tools will sort of fall into place um, instead of always tink tinkering around with tools and sort of data conversion. Um, and then often it so happens that in the end you won't make the data available in this shared format. Um, I think I'm, can anyone sort of give me my current time? I'm, I'm sort of lost in what the latest schedule was like. I think you should get to the end. Exactly. So the thing <laughs> is that this was basically the end. Um, I have more material. Uh, well, not I have. I prepared more prepared material in case um, I would have had more time. But I, I think that was basically meant to be the final slide. <laughs>